Hey, this is Rishi, and today we're going to be talking about subsolid nodules, what they are, and why we treat them differently from solid nodules. So first, it's important to remember what a nodule is. So this is from the Fleischner Glossary. A nodule is just a round or irregular opacity that measures less than 3 centimeters. When we see nodules on CT, we often look at multiple characteristics like the size, the shape, and the borders. Well, another important characteristic is the attenuation. In other words, is the nodule solid or is it subsolid? A solid nodule is one in which the underlying lung parenchyma is completely obscured, like in this nodule right here. A subsolid nodule can be of two kinds. One kind is completely ground glass, in which the whole nodule is ground glass in attenuation and it does not obscure the underlying lung architecture and the other is part solid in which some of the lesion obscures the underlying lung parenchyma but there's also a ground glass component that does not obscure the lung parenchyma. So when you have a subsolid nodule it's important to say whether it's completely ground glass or whether it's part solid. The reason why we treat solid nodules differently from subsolid nodules is that subsolid nodules are more likely to be lung cancer compared to solid nodules. All right, so if you had 100 subsolid nodules and 100 solid nodules, you're going to have more lung cancers in the group of subsolid nodules. Now, on the other hand, solid lung cancers are more aggressive than subsolid lung cancers. Let's look at that a little bit more closely. This is an important article that came out of the Journal of Thoracic Oncology in 2011 in which lung adenocarcinomas were reclassified. Prior to this, the term bronchoalveolar carcinoma was used for multiple entities, including adenocarcinoma in situ, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma, and so on. Now, for the purposes of this talk, I'd like to draw your attention to a few entities. Atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, which is a precancerous condition. Adenocarcinoma in situ, which is cancer, but it's pre-invasive. Minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. And lipidic predominant invasive adenocarcinoma. And the reason why we're focusing on these tumors is that these are the tumors that are likely to be subsolid in attenuation. Now, from a radiologic perspective, it's helpful to think about these entities as existing along a spectrum of increasing invasiveness and malignant potential. So atypical adenomatous hyperplasia will have epithelial proliferation, but it's going to have mild to moderate atypia as compared to adenocarcinoma in situ, which will have moderate to severe atypia. And there's multiple different things a pathologist will look at to differentiate these two entities like cellular crowding and density, the presence or absence of coarse chromatin, and so on. For adenocarcinoma in situ, this is considered cancer, but as the in situ component suggests, the cells are still growing in a lipidic pattern. In other words, they're growing along the alveolar walls and respiratory bronchioles and not invading the stroma. Now, that's different from minimally invasive adenocarcinoma in which there is an invasive component that's seen pathologically. It's called minimally invasive because that invasive component is by definition less than five millimeters in size. Now, when we're talking about invasive adenocarcinomas, there's multiple different subtypes. The subtype that I'm interested for this talk is the lipidic predominant invasive adenocarcinoma and that differs from minimally invasive adenocarcinoma in that the invasive component in this entity is greater than 5 millimeters, whereas the invasive component in this entity is less than 5 millimeters. Now, from a radiologic perspective, as you go from left to right along this spectrum, the lesions increase in size and density. So, for a lesion that is five millimeters or less and pure ground glass, that's more likely to be atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. And as you increase in size and the solid component, that's more likely to be minimally invasive adenocarcinoma or invasive adenocarcinoma. 
Now for lipidic predominant invasive adenocarcinoma, depending on how much of an invasive component you have, you can have a lesion that's mostly or completely solid. But in general, the increasing size of the solid component means that you have an increasing chance of having invasiveness. So if I were dictating a case with multiple subsolid lesions, I would list in the impression as number one, the lesion with the largest solid component, because in my mind, that is the most suspicious lesion with the highest potential of being invasive. So for this lesion, which is a pure ground glass nodule, I would give a differential at the first time point of infection or inflammation, atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, or adenocarcinoma, likely in situ. Usually instead of saying adenocarcinoma in situ, I give the term low-grade adenocarcinoma. Now if we get a follow-up and that lesion is still there, it's not likely at that point to be infection or inflammation, but it could be focal fibrosis. So I would add that to the differential, take out infection or inflammation, and then I would still keep atypical adenomatous hyperplasia and adenocarcinoma. Now, what about a lesion that's part solid? So for the first time point, I would still include infection or inflammation. I would move adenocarcinoma to number two, and in this case, it's likely minimally invasive, although I usually don't say that. And then three, I would put atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. Now, I would still include atypical adenomatous hyperplasia because this solid component may not indicate an invasive component all the time. It could represent a little area of mucus plugging or atelectasis. So that's why I still include atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. At the second time point, I take out infection inflammation, put in focal fibrosis, and I would still keep adenocarcinoma and atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. Now when you measure these lesions, it's important to measure both the entire lesion and the solid component. And that's because in the TNM staging criteria, the T component, the tumor size, is based on the solid part of the lesion, not the entire lesion. So in this example, the solid part of this lesion is 15 millimeters, which would make it a T1B and not 25 millimeters, which would make it a T1C. Now there's a few other features that would increase my suspicion that I'm dealing with cancer. One is whether there's tenting of the fissure, and you can see there's a little bit of deflection of the fissure here, but that's easier to see on the sagittal images. So if you're trying to decide whether there's tenting of the fissure, look at the sagittal images to help you. The presence of spiculated margins makes it more suspicious for cancer and the presence of air bronchograms makes it more suspicious for cancer. So when we're talking about management, there's a lot of considerations that go into how to manage these lesions. These are just a few. So size and growth are probably two of the most important. The presence or absence and size of the solid component, which remember that tells you the likelihood of having an invasive component. The other suspicious characteristics, tenting of the fissure, air bronchograms, and spiculated borders. The presence of other nodules, patient's age and comorbidities, and then whether it's a screening or incidental finding. Now for lung cancer screening, LungRADS has management recommendations for part solid nodules and for ground glass nodules. Take a look at the management recommendation for ground glass nodules measuring up to 30 millimeters. It says that these are to be followed with low-dose CT in 12 months. The reason we can do that is that these cancers tend to have a very slow growth rate compared to solid cancers, so it's okay in some cases to follow it at 12-month intervals. For incidentally detected lesions, there are recommendations from the 2017 Fleischner Society guidelines. It's important to remember that these recommendations don't apply to lung cancer screening, patients with immunosuppression, or patients with known primary cancer. Also, these recommendations are for patients who are 35 years and older. But it's important to remember that these are just recommendations and the management of these lesions should be individualized to the patient based on a host of factors, including the patient's preferences. So deciding whether to just follow the lesion radiographically, biopsy, radiate, or resect should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, that's all I have for this video. Here are some references which I'll link in the description below. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below.